The Lord be with you. It's great to see you. It uh, seems like it's been a long time since I've been anticipating coming and being here, and you have made us feel so welcome, and uh, we are really looking forward to getting to know you, getting to know each one of you, and um, I've just heard so many great things about St. Paul and, and about who you are and what, you, what you've done in the past, and we are excited about what God will also do here in the future. So we, we are just thrilled to be here with you and to be a part of St. Paul. Um, some of you have been asking what to call me, and uh, I want you to know I'm perfectly fine you can, with Don. You can call me Don. That's great. Uh, a lot, I know a lot of people are not comfortable with that, so you can call me Pastor Don, Dr. Don, Dr. D. That's what people normally have called me. Uh, but whatever you come up with, rest assured, I've probably been called worse. So, <laughs> so, so it'll be fine. Um, I thought it would be appropriate on my first Sunday at St. Paul to uh, read from the scriptures of one of the letters of St. Paul. And this comes at the very end of the book of Romans in chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever, through Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You know, Paul wrote to the Romans, a, really an unusual phrase. He said, um, now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel. Well, there's only one gospel. <laughs> there's just the gospel, the story of Jesus' incarnation and life and death and burial and resurrection. That's the gospel. But Paul was talking about my gospel. And, and although there's only one gospel, we all become believers in that gospel and followers of Jesus in a lot of different ways. If uh, we were to take the time this morning for everybody in here who was a follower of Jesus to stand up and, and tell how you became a follower of Jesus, your story would be unique because we all come to faith in different ways. And so in that sense, Paul was saying, this is my gospel. This is how I became a follower of Jesus and this is what I've shared with you. And so this morning, I wanted to share with you my gospel. I want to tell you a little bit about how I became a follower of Jesus. Because I think if you understand that, then it'll help you understand why I do what I do and why I say what I say and why I believe what I believe. So this morning, I want to take just a little bit of the time to share my gospel with you. Now, I was raised on a farm in North Alabama. My father was a farmer. But when I was six years old, he died. And about a year and a half later, uh, we lost the farm, we lost the house, we lost everything. And my mother, who was 51 years old at the time, with a 10th grade education, who had only been a farm wife her whole life, went out with two children still living at home, and she did the best she could do and she put a roof over our heads and she put food on the table. And I only tell you this because I want you to understand that early in my life, I was not a fan of God, okay? <laughs> I felt like uh, he had certainly dropped the ball. Now my mother was a very faithful Christian and she was a dedicated Methodist. And so was her mother, my grandmother. And so they faithfully went to the Methodist Church and were part of the, uh, you know, the, the UMW. And um, so as a child, I went with my mother and my grandmother and my sister, and we went to the Methodist Church. But I quickly convinced my mother that it was more trouble to take me than it was to leave me at home. And, uh, and she gave in. And so I just didn't go to church. It, I didn't want to go. I didn't care to go. And when I was at that point in my life, I didn't know what the word agnostic meant, but that's what I was. I believed that, you know, there probably was a God who created all this stuff. 
But whoever that God was, he wasn't interested in me. And he didn't care about my family. And he wasn't paying attention because as far as I'm concerned, things you know, had come off the wheels and God didn't seem to care. So if there was a God, if he did love us, things ought to look a lot different than they did. And so that was kind of my attitude. When I was in high school, I met this guy named Mike. We played football together. Now, Mike was a real Christian. He didn't just go to church on Sunday morning. He actually tried to follow Jesus every day. And Mike was always inviting me to his church. I didn't want to go. I, I like Mike, but I, I could not care less about going to his church. And I didn't want to keep coming up with excuses about why I couldn't make it. So I, I took another course of action. I lied. Mike would say, hey, Don, why don't you come to my church this Sunday? And I would say, that's great, Mike. What time's church start? He'd say, 11. I would say, you know, that's great. I'll be there. And then I just didn't go. And this went on and on. Mike would invite me to stuff. He'd say, hey, why don't you come to this thing? Yeah, Mike, what time's it start? And, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> and I just didn't come. Hey, Don, the students are getting together Friday night, and we're going to, it's going to be fun. At the church, we're going to have this, this thing, and, oh, that sounds great, Mike. What time? Seven. Great. I just didn't go. And this just went on and on. And, you know, Mike was a defensive lineman, so I, I thought this could go on indefinitely. But um, one day he said, you know, my church is having a revival. You remember those? And he said, Tuesday night is student night. And so after the service, we're going to go to Fellowship Hall and everybody will be there. And it's going to be food. It's going to be really good. So why don't you come? And I said, sure, Mike. <laughs> I'd love to come. What time's it start? He said, seven. I said, great. He said, good. I'll pick you up at 630. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> well, I didn't see that coming. But that was well played, Mike. So I figured, you know, I can go and spend two hours at the church and, you know, I can endure. The first hour will be terrible, but the next part I'll be with my friends and, yeah, it'll, it'll be okay. I, I can make it through this night unscathed. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> you know, I find it fascinating in life that some of the decisions that you take very little time to make that you don't think are important at all, end up being the ones that change your life. Like on the spur of the moment, Mike decided, I'll pick you up. Uh, like when your class gets canceled in college and then you just pick one out of the blue to fulfill the requirement and the cute girl sitting behind you becomes your wife. <laughs> Things just happen that you didn't think were that important, but it leads to something that changes the trajectory of your whole life. And so Mike picked me up and we went to church and I don't remember much about what happened or what was done. I remember at this church, they sang that hymn, Morning Has Broken. I love that. That's a great hymn, Doctor. I love that hymn. I didn't know it was a hymn. And I thought, this is a really cool church because they do Cat Stevens here. <laughs> these are really, these are kind of with it people. And I don't remember what was said. But I remember that that night, for the first time in my life, I understood that the God who created everything that exists loved me. And not just me, but everybody. Amen. And then I began to understand that God had not abandoned me like I thought, but that God had been with me and that God had suffered when I suffered that God hurt when I hurt, and that God loved us. And I was completely overwhelmed by that understanding. It completely and totally changed my life. It's been decades now since that Tuesday night, and I still haven't gotten over it. I wake up every morning overwhelmed that this God who created everything that exists loves us. It is amazing. 
And so, you know, I was baptized and, and strangers in that church didn't know me, took me in. They loved me. They showed an interest in my life. They prayed for me. They spent time with me. So you see, when Dr. Brad read that this morning, love changed my life. Amen. It, was, it was the love of God. And there was the love of the people who follow God. And it changed my life. It changed everything. And so that's why I really believe that, that love is the beginning, love is the middle, and love is the end. And that, that everything we do has to be motivated by that love. St. Paul said, without it, then everything we do is just nothing. But the love is what makes it important. Now, you already know that because you already love each other. And from the ministries that St. Paul does in this community, you show the community that you love them. But one of the things I'm going to do as your pastor is I'm going to remind you it's about love. That's the foundation. That's the core. And you remind me, because I forget sometimes too. And we'll keep each other on track and moving in the direction God would have us to move. Now, from time to time, I'm sure that I will say something in a sermon that you don't agree with. And I want you to know that's okay. I'm not going to ask you to agree with me. I am going to ask you to think with me to pray with me, to listen to the Holy Spirit with me. Because here's the truth. If you come to church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, and your image of God never gets stretched, your long-held beliefs never get challenged, then you're not getting your money's worth. <laughs> because I'll tell you, as I read the scripture and as I try to follow Jesus, my image of God gets stretched. And my long-held beliefs get challenged. And when God puts the thumb on me, I'm bringing it to you. We're going to all have to deal with it, okay? Because I don't like going through all that by myself. But that's how we grow as Christians. We grow when our images and our ideas get challenged. We grow when we have to rethink and repray about things. We don't grow if we come every Sunday and just hear somebody say the things we've already believed for 50 years. And so, so we want to grow together spiritually and individually, because that's important. And along with you, I want to see St. Paul grow. I really am optimistic about the future at this church. I'm optimistic about what I believe God wants to do together that, that I get to be a part of with you. You see, I believe that this year COVID will move from being a pandemic to becoming an endemic. And then that will change a lot of things because it'll open things up and we can go back to doing some of the things that we were used to doing. But we can also do some new things that we haven't done before. Because our goal is not going to be to be like we were before COVID, but to be who God wants us to be in the future moving forward. It's been a long two, nearly three years of dealing with this pandemic and I'm tired. We're all tired. Everybody's tired. We've all experienced a sense of loss. There's so much anger and division and loss of relationships in our culture. There has never been a greater need, nor I believe a greater time, for people to hear the good news. That as we come out of this pandemic, there is a God to help us, and that God is head over heels in love with you. I believe people are receptive to hear that now more than ever. And there's a verse from the Old Testament, believe it or not, when I think about church growth and what it means to, to reach out to the community, it's this verse from the Old Testament that, that comes to my mind. It's from uh, the book of Zechariah. Your favorite book, right? You're probably reading there this morning. But listen to this verse. This is a wonderful verse. This is Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages and nations 
will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we've heard that God is with you. Now he's writing to them about, they've been in exile and now they're going to go back to Jerusalem and go back to the temple. And he says, you know, as you come out of exile, people are going to come up to you and grab you by the arm and say they want to go with you because they heard God is present with you. What a great image. Coming out of COVID is a little bit like coming out of exile, isn't it? <laughs> and we're having a change and we have new opportunities in front of us. And the main thing we need to remember is that God is present with us. I love that song we sang this morning. The presence of the Lord is in this place. God is present with us. And I love the way Zechariah describes it. Imagine if it were to happen for us here at St. Paul, the way Zechariah said it was going to happen for them. You'd be in Publix in the produce section. And some total stranger would come up to you and tap you on the shoulder and say, do you go to St. Paul? Will you take me with you? I hear God is present at St. Paul. I heard that in your church, there are Republicans and there are Democrats and they don't hate each other. <laughs> I heard that the love for Jesus is greater than our own personal tribal narratives. I'm so tired of the anger, so tired of the fighting. Can I go with you? I'd love to be a part of something like that. And then you're over in another aisle trying to figure out what flavor Pop-Tart to get. And somebody says, isn't that a Fort Pinellas t-shirt you're wearing? You go to St. Paul, don't you? Hey, would it be all right if I came with you? I hear God is present there. You know, I heard that the folks at that church have made painful sacrifices to embrace the future. I want to be a part of that. Can I go with you? And then you're at the checkout line and somebody tugs on your sleeve. And they say, hey, do you go to St. Paul? Will you take me with you? I was told that if I go to St. Paul, that I will be welcomed, I'll be accepted, and I'll be loved. And you know, that's not true everywhere. Can I come with you? I hear the presence of God is there. Now, it probably won't be that easy. <laughs> but in the last few years, we have all experienced loss and frustration and a greater degree of loneliness than most of us had ever known before. And we're ready for something different. We're ready for something new. Who isn't looking for a community where people get along and love each other even if they don't agree on everything? Who isn't looking for a community that's focused on the future and believes the best is yet to come? Who isn't looking for a community where they'll be loved and accepted and welcomed. And it's not just about being that community here, it's about taking that community with us out into wherever we go so that people can be a part. I really believe there are a lot of people in Pinellas County who would want to be a part of a community like that. I know I would, wouldn't you? Amen.